Despite the relative youth of the gaming scene and furthermore the indie scene, some developers and studios have already been garnering substantial amounts of credibility for themselves among fans and critics alike. Independent development company Supergiant Games has one such reputation, boasting one of the most successful batting averages for a development studio. Their first game, Bastion, premiered on the Xbox Live Arcade to universal acclaim in July of 2011, before porting to PCs and eventually every other major platform. While the company is still substantially close-knit, with a company roster of only 20 people, Bastion was developed over two years by a team of just seven people. The whole crew wasn't actually working in one location either, with many involved members never meeting in person until the game was nearly released. Bastion gathered very little traction during its first few presentations in 2010, though after an impressive display at the 2011 Game Developers Conference, Warner Brothers Interactive offered to publish the game, an offer which Supergiant agreed upon in order to get around the certification process to publish on the Xbox 360. The game went on to sell half a million copies in 2011, 200,000 of which were on the Xbox Live Arcade. By 2015, it had sold over 3 million copies total. Alongside the impressive sales, Bastion has claimed more than a handful of rightly deserved awards for its gameplay, story, soundtrack, and overall creativity. Supergiant Games has now released one smash hit after the other, including Transistor in 2014, Pyre in 2017, and Hades in 2020. Let's take a look at the start of this prolific studio's success as we uncover what's so great about Bastion. In Bastion, players fill the shoes of a quiet protagonist referred to only as the Kid, as he wakes up in the aftermath of an apocalyptic event known as the Calamity. In the wake of this event, the vast majority of the land of Ceylondia has been destroyed and its inhabitants turned to stone. The bastion within the game is presented as an emergency meeting spot for any survivors of disaster. The kid may be one of the very few survivors of the calamity, and one of the only important characters in the game at all, but there are still interesting relationships to be witnessed and compelling stories to be told. As the player completes levels and collects fragments of this now-destroyed city, they'll be able to return to the Bastion between excursions to invest their hard-earned rewards in the reconstruction of their home base, which further supplements the gameplay with all sorts of new opportunities for the player. Players are free to build the Bastion as they see fit, as long as they've accrued enough supplies, but whether they'd rather focus on abilities or weaponry, for instance, is up to them. As the game gets up to speed, the player will be introduced to their two primary attacks, the kid's trusty hammer and a gun which can be fired in eight directions while standing still. The player will also find a bow soon after, followed by an expansive array of weapons with unique combat styles. As they collect more weapon options, players will be able to swamp through their tools for the best loadout whenever they visit the arsenal and upgrade the capabilities of each weapon at the forge. The combat in this game is quick to learn and pretty fluid once you feel comfortable in it, featuring means of dodging, countering, blocking, and both ranged and melee attacks. Basically every feature that we've come to expect from most modern action RPGs. With each level up, the kid's health bar will expand, but the player will also find access to new spirits at the distillery in town, which can be equipped freely across up to 10 slots, greatly customizing the player's experience. Bastion features an amazing world to just get lost in. There are far more unique environments than I would have expected without straying from the earthy tones that attract players to the world of Ceylondia in the first place. Coupling each sage's unique decor with the soothing rambles of the narrator allows players to actually enjoy learning about something as mundane as a swamp or an abandoned mineshaft and the history of that location prior to the calamity, without making them pause the action and adventure to read a passage in a book or listen to an NPC's very specific dialogue. Everything remains consistently fresh and engaging throughout Bastion's experience. The fact that platforms appear as you reach them means that there's no way to get tired of looking at the world as you wander down miscellaneous routes in search of your next objective. It's really difficult to maintain an audience's attention and interest for more than a few hours into your game before everything often begins looking the same. But in Bastion, exploration is consistently interesting even if there isn't a powerful new weapon at the end of every branching path, because the player's reward is watching this interesting world come together right before their eyes. 
Notable at the time of Bastion's release, and honestly still to this day, is the fact that there aren't many successful instances of games using an isometric point of view as an artistic choice. For the most part, this format was seen as a primitive way of conveying 3D movement on hardware only capable of rendering two-dimensional graphics, such as in Marble Madness or Sonic 3D Blast. One huge drawback of isometric visuals, if done poorly, is the player being unable to gauge their speed and direction effectively without the help of some very obvious guidelines, usually in the form of checkerboard patterns to accommodate their perspective. Bastion actually does feature several checkerboard segments, but in a clever bridge between technical limitations and unique creativity, the fragmented world of Ceylandia in the aftermath of the Calamity can be composed of suspiciously geometric chunks of Earth in order to basically provide the same sense of guidance without the irritating visual patterns that are associated with an isometric perspective. The fractured world design was chosen so that the artists could incorporate a sky into the game, despite the traditional downward point of view seen in isometric games. Meanwhile, the soft, painterly art style was intended to stray from both the colorless depictions of post-apocalyptic settings, as well as the grating sharpness seen in pixelated isometric games. Bastion's composer, Darren Korb, has described the soundtrack as acoustic frontier trip-hop composed of heavily sampled beats topped with acoustic instrumentation. This unique juxtaposition combines sensations of both a fantasy world and the American Old West, and has very few comparable examples in the gaming world. You wouldn't expect it from the final presentation and degree of quality, but the music, sound effects, and narration for Bastion were all recorded in Corb's apartment closet. Several video games have narrators, and many of them are entertaining, but this one is otherworldly. Bastion's narration features the voice of Logan Cunningham, who players may also recognize from any of Supergiant's more recent projects, including the titular Greek god in 2020's Hades. The narrator, who is quickly revealed to be Rux, one of the only other survivors of the Calamity, is incredibly well performed, and tells the story of the game's events in a manner that sounds as if it happened long ago, yet is also still unraveling as he speaks. The ground forms up under his feet as it point the way. He don't stop to wonder why. There is a shocking degree of potential dialogue options from the narrator, over 3,000 lines in fact, many of which are never expected to be witnessed by a single player. With multiple possible phrases at the ready whenever the kid equips certain combinations of weapons, restarts a level after death, or even tries to talk to characters with no current topics for discussion. Ain't always much to say. This makes the narrator an ever-present character to fill the void of our nearly mute protagonist, and pushes along the story in an entertaining way. With the constant campfire-style narration, there's always a sense of guidance without holding the player's hand. It's difficult to feel lost, yet at the same time, it's actually fun to not know where you're headed as the ground appears in front of you. Prior to Bastion, the majority of games released by independent developers prominently featured platforming and puzzle aspects, providing a similar sensation to the boom of the home gaming scene in the 80s, with platform and puzzle games spearheading commercial growth due to accessibility and replayability. However, if the indie gaming ecosystem were comparable to the life of the NES, we would have our Super Mario Bros. and Castlevania, but we were still missing The Legend of Zelda, an immersive action-adventure which took players' choices and desires into account for a tailor-made experience, no matter how short. With strips of land that could just as easily have been present in the design of a platforming game, the developers at Supergiant created an enchanting world for a compelling role-playing game, without the overwhelming commitment of an open world or 30-hour adventure. This is true for the difficulty of this small team of developers to create such an immense project, as well as the commitment by the player to remain interested long enough to discover all of the cool features sprinkled throughout the game. The player can easily pop between main stages or challenge grounds, and just as readily return to the Bastion to select different weapons and abilities or engage in bonus challenges. Supergiant really managed to trim the fat from the RPG experience, without reducing any quality in the story, combat system, world building, or overall experience. That is what's so great about Bastion. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we piece together the unique world of Bastion. 
Want to see some bonus content? Maybe support the creation of these videos? If so, check out the What's So Great Discord, Twitch, or Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.